biggest city, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. Our next speaker is uh, Darlene Lim. And uh, last year, Darlene Lim captured all our hearts, uh, not only because of her impressive knowledge, but because of her utterly beguiling and infectious enthusiasm. The object of her excitement was the prospect of robotic landings on Mars and the possibility that mankind's most age-old and aching question might be answered, are we alone? Well, the rovers are there now, and even as we speak, they appear to be poking around in a lot of dust and rock, but what they're really looking for is water or trace of water and the life that seems inevitably to be associated with water. Well, since then, a lot of data has been gathered, and we've asked her to come back and unfold the story for us Thank further. Irene. Well, it really is a pleasure to be back again this year. Today, I want to get into more details. I'm going to talk to you about two things specifically. The first one is Mars analog research. This is a field of planetary sciences that I'm involved, when, involved in uh, at the NASA Ames Research Center. And the second thing I want to talk to you about today, this may be a new concept to many of you, or this may be something you've uh, already heard about. And this is the concept of a Canadian-led mission to Mars. So let's get into it. If I could have the first slide, please. Um, now, what is Mars analog research? Essentially, Mars analog research is a comparative science. And that involves going out to parts of the Earth that are extremely Mars-like, be it very cold, perhaps very um, interesting from a biological standpoint in, in terms of our, our knowledge that we could gain from that part of the world and compare it to Mars. Which brings me to the Atacama Desert in Chile, where I just got back from on Friday. And uh, this is, parts of the desert, of this particular desert, are actually considered to be the driest places on Earth. Um, and so it's an absolutely fantastic place to work. We were actually down there doing an analog project examining life-limiting environmental conditions. And the reason why uh, we went down there to do that is because in parts of this desert, there is actually no resolvable bacteria. And what I mean by that is, if you were to drop a piece of food on the ground, you know that whole th three second rule thing? Well, essentially, <laughs> that's completely moot there. You could drop it on the ground, roll it around for 10 minutes, and pop it back in your mouth, and nothing would happen to you. So it's really amazing because <laughs> You don't really see this anywhere else in the world. You usually find bacteria that you can culture and that you can count. Well, we can't do this in certain regions of the Atacama Desert. But the reason why I bring this up is because for all that wonderful data that we're getting back from Mars, from all the incredible missions that have actually made their way to Mars more than any other planet in our solar system, of course, barring our own, we still know so very little about the red planet. We still know very little about our own planet, in fact. And the thing is, um, it's a very, there's a very interesting project going on in that part of the Anacama because uh, Carnegie Mellon has sent a team of roboticists there. They did that about a year and a bit ago. And they sent them there with an automated rover. And that rover's job was to roll through that part of the desert, pick up a whole bunch of data, and then send that back to a team of awaiting scientists back at NASA Ames in California. Now, that team had actually never seen that site in the Atacama Desert before. And they were, they were supposed to take all that data and then from there, characterize that part of the world, figure out what had happened to that place geologically, and also look for signs of life. As I said, it's been about a year and a bit, and they're still looking at that data, they're still analyzing it and starting to characterize it. We went and visited that site while we were down in Chile, and in 10 minutes, 10 minutes, we found life. That life was found not because we're super fantastic individuals, but because we have a collective pool of intuition to work from. We knew where to go, we knew how to look, and we found that life. Of course, we didn't tell the people back at NASA Ames because they'd hate us. But anyways, <laughs> part two. <laughs> part two is where I want to talk to you all about the possibility of a Canadian-led mission to Mars. What does that mean? That means that we allow our Canadian researchers here, both in the academic stream and in the industrial stream, to get together and to conceive of a mission to Mars and also to lead that mission to Mars. 
Now, this is going to be a monumental endeavor, but one that we are really going to have to start thinking strongly about because you're going to hear more and more and more about this as time goes on. Now, the thing is, we need to consider three things in order to decide whether or not we could actually mount a mission to Mars, our own Canadian-led mission to Mars. And I've broken those three things down. I think what they are is we need to consider whether or not we are ready, we need to consider whether or not we're able, and whether or not we're willing to actually undertake a mission of this scope, this scale. So let me break each one of them down. Let me see what kind of time I'm dealing with here. OK. So let's talk about whether or not we're able. Do we have the expertise in Canada to be able to handle a mission to Mars? Absolutely, yes, we do. In fact, we have a whole history of space exploration under our belt. Did you know that, in fact, many of you probably know this, we were the third nation into space after the Soviets and the Americans. We sent the first geosynchronous, geosynchronous satellite into orbit in 1972. This is Anik-1. And currently, if we have to stop and think about the breadth and the depth of expertise that would be required to actually mount a Canadian mission to Mars, we definitely have the bench strength. And I really think it's time that we gave our research players the opportunity to shine. And so definitely, I would say that we are able to go. Now, are we ready to go? Do we have the money? the ability financially to mount a mission, mission such as this. Now, the kind of Canadian-led mission that we're talking about is akin to what is termed as a scout class mission at NASA. Scout class missions are sort of smallish missions, around $325 million US, um, that are efficient and economical and that have succeeded and will continue to su succeed um, as, as far as making their way to Mars. Now, of that $325 million US, $80 million of that is actually set aside to account for launch costs. Now, the Canadian Space Agency has actually said that they absolutely can do it within their budget. Their budget is $300 million Canadian dollars. Now, the region, reason why they think they can do it without, without having to get any more money, um, any more uh, sort of federal injection although of funding, although I'm sure they'd love to be able to have some federal injection of, of funding, um, but the thing is, we can actually partner up internationally and find ways to defray that launch cost. And so what essentially happens is we can write off immediately that $80 million. So what that does is it affords us the ability to think about launching a Canadian-led mission to Mars for around 200, 250 million Canadian dollars. And so that is a huge possibility right now that the CSA is working very, very hard on. So are we ready to go financially? I would say absolutely. Now, this brings me to the last of the three little points here, and that is whether or not we're willing to go. And I would say we're not just, the, we're not just there yet, which is why I've put willing in sort of this it's blue, because we're not totally passionate about it yet. Um, I'm willing to go. You guys know where I net out on this. <laughs> but the thing is, it can't just be me that wants to go. It has to be. <laughs> It has to be the collective. It has to be the collective voice that says, yes, absolutely, I think this should happen. I believe that we need to embark on a vision for Canada that includes going to space, doing our own missions to space, and I also believe that we need to continue to do space exploration because it is our responsibility. As I said last year, as much as it is our responsibility to manage the environment, and also to just basically take care of our fellow human beings, it is also our responsibility to explore. And once again, I really feel that we're not going to net out that far apart from each other. And I believe that it is this sort of tightness of citizenship that's going to allow us to generate the will to tackle our responsibilities when it comes to ourselves, to Canada, and to the world. And it's also going to allow us to generate the Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.